The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Can you tell me what you, so it, there are actually a lot of themes that are crisscrossing in this, uh, in this documentary. It's pretty well done for, for, tr for managing to bring many of those themes up. So uh, before we, before sort of I summarize them, I'd like to have you, your impression of what are, the, what are the themes that seems to be important. Uh, in like hard decisions to get educated, the government decisions, the parents' decision, etc. Yeah, Ben. So cultural preservation. Um, it, it, I forget the other group. It was the Kurds in uh, just the rest of Turkey, right, mainstream the, the Turkey. Short, mainstream Turkey, and how Kurds want to preserve their culture, and how that had spillover effects. They think that how they operate in the home. Right. So one one issue that is kind of there is whether. The whole education is a way to mainstream the cards, which they are like suspicious about. So that's a good point. Yeah, I was going to say uh, infrastructure. So actually, physically getting to school becomes a problem. Um, the guy mentioned like when it snows, um, it becomes hard for the children to get to school, so they, become, they fall behind, and they have a desire to be a boarding school or like those um, schools actually in their village, but because they don't have that. Right, so there is a supply constraint. There are no schools in the villages and getting to, they go by bus, but even that is difficult because the infrastructure is difficult. It can also be hard to find justification for this education because um, although some people argue that there is still value to it, even if girls or boys who get educated just come back to the village and live with their family, but a lot of people say, that, well, what is the point? So there is a question of the benefits of education. What do they think the, the Yaprak's parent, what do they think the benefit of education is for her? What do they expect from the education? It's for her to come back and continue to live. Is it what they say? Or oh, it's someone else who says that? What do the parents say, the mom? And then Yaprak say it also. Her mom says that she wanted to become a doctor. She wants, her mom says she wants her to be, become a doctor. She also wants to become a doctor. And so she sees, and in fact, there is this debate where, where people are saying, well, what's the point of education if we don't have a job that will take into account this education? And then there is this other guy who says, well, even if she doesn't become a doctor, there are these other things. But it seems to have a little bit of a minority view in this. Although when Yaprak you don't see anyone asking her the question, but she answers saying, yeah, yeah, there would be some value. Uh, but there is a bit of a, like, somewhat of a debate there. There's also the lack of, you're talking about supply, there's a lack of supply of teachers, sort of. So in particular regions, like the Eastern region, for example, um, you know, teachers have to be brought in. So there's like a cultural sort of thing. They're coming from different regions where the culture is different, and then at the same time, they may not particularly be there. Um, they're passing through. You mentioned that um, you know they're coming there to train or to uh, to get experience in this way, and then they move on. So there's no sustainability. There's not. When you think about teaching, it's important that teachers build relationships with students and uh, really pour into them. But when they're in this like transit sort of mindset, it becomes a little hard to do that. Right. So that's another supply issue. Also from the supply side is whether there are enough teachers, and then that kind of interacts slightly with the culture issue, whether who are these teachers. I think you're making two points that are both important. One is the point that the teachers who are coming through may not be as motivated, they might not be accountable to the community, they might uh, be difficult to discipline, they might not care. And on the other, in addition, they might be the ones who are trying to you know, teach in talk and not in court and all of that, so that brings the cultural dim dimension. Yep. Thing that another thing that I don't I didn't realize right now they mentioned in the movie, but um, <clears throat> there's a problem like if all these all these girls are actually living in those foreign schools for most of the week and they're just going back for the weekend, um, you know they don't have that sort of family community that's going to actually give them like more guidance. So 
even though you know they'll be getting education, there's there's a huge drawback for the fact that they don't have you know their parents right there and tell them what they have to do, and like nobody really knows what that could you know what that could cause in the long run. Like you guys, uh, far from your families. Uh, yeah, I think this is this sort of comes a little bit in filigrane when they have this debate about, I think they want, they would like to have the schools in their villages, they don't like to send the schools to, the kids to boarding school. I think one issue is this, you know, are the kids mature enough to manage in boarding school? And the other, which is in filigrane of that, is are they going to become different? Are they going to absorb these values that, peop that uh, these guys are not necessarily looking forward. So it might also be a slight, there might also be a slight conflict underlying this where, where actually from the point of view of the Turkish government who is trying to make the Kurds into regular Turks, it's actually a good thing to get, to get them away from the families. Well, from the point of view of the Kurds, that's kind of a, a, a way of, uh, of uh, for, furthering the, the assimilation. So that's one thing that goes with education, which you find in a lot of places where, for example, there was a big education drive in, in Indonesia that I'm going to talk in a little bit, which had exactly the same idea, is that when you want to educate, education is about imparting skills, it's also about imparting a worldview, and then therefore that creates conflict between uh, the different people who have different ideas about what this world, worldview should be. Yeah, so that goes back to this, what is the value of education? What's the benefit of education? So it comes back to, well, fine, if she graduates and becomes a doctor, that's great. But if not, what has the education brought? Maybe not, nothing. So people might not necessarily see the value of the education that's imparted as being that great, unless you can make it to being a doctor, which seems to be, you know, which, which would be great, but is a bit more of a leap. Actually, a question. So I forget how many children in the household my understanding is that they only sent one to school. Like the impact that has on the children who aren't in school. So I don't know, I know the mom at least said that, you know, that she wasn't happy if she would like to be in that, have an access to education to improve that. But is that mindset kind of perpetuated because you have a child who's going to school and kind of puts you in further grief at your current circumstance, which could pose another problem? That's an interesting question is that, so for example, the sister of this girl, Yaprak, what's her name was, Mehmet, she wasn't in school she, because she was too old to benefit from the compulsory education. And uh, uh, so on the one hand, she, she sees the, she gets some indirect benefits, spillover benefit from the fact that Yaprak is educated. On the other hand, she also gets like this education envy and feels that, oh, it would have been great if I could have been educated myself. So that's, that's, that's an interesting point. I, 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 we kind of spoke about this before, but just the idea of the value of education and what are the returns to it. So like, when, when you're much poor, like you just can't raise anything higher. You think about education, like it's much, the, the, be, the returns are gonna be much farther off. So. This was sort of mentioned, but you know, you get to a certain point and you need some education, but then after a while it's kind of like, well, you'd probably be more valuable if you just stayed home and you know, helped out around the house. So there's that sort of, there's a, a dichotomy, I guess, between like the, the social pressure for education and the, the home pressure to like help your family out. Um, you know, we need to eat tomorrow, so this is a little bit more important. You know, you'll be able to go to school when you feel like it or when get a little bit older or maybe you'll just, you don't, you won't need to go to school because we need to survive right now. Right, so there is another cost other than the cost of getting yourself to school and you know that now the government is paying for the bus and it's paying for the school, etc. But there is another cost uh, which is in economic jargon we call the opportunity cost, which is while you're in school you're not helping around the house. And uh, that is something that is mentioned in the movie at some point where they're saying, well, that's kind of one reason why people are not complying to the edict is people are feeling that they are getting around the house. And uh, you said it exactly right. There is a trade-off between, even if you don't bear the direct cost of schooling like is the case here, there is a trade-off between the opportunity cost, so you're losing the value of the child work now, 
and the benefits that are far out in the future. Potentially very far out in the future if you, if you think that it's worth getting an education only if you can become a doctor. So that is the debate that they have at some point, which is at least some people feel that if you go back to the village, you've just wasted your time. Some, uh, so the only value is to being a doctor, and at the same time they realize that it's not super likely that it happens. Uh, and then in general, there is someone says that it's hard, easier for men than for women to get jobs outside the village. There might be the other point I was made earlier that they might not want the girls to really leave to be outside the village they might accept them for them to live to be a doctor, but they might be less likely to, de to let them live to become like a, a ca uh, uh, to man a registrar in a supermarket, which you could use, wi which maybe is a job you could get with, get with eighth grade education without continuing. And so if you're not going to leave uh, the village to take that job, and they feel that there is no value in between, then you would have no, uh, no reason to pay the opportunity cost. Uh, so that's where the kind of this debate or tension comes up. Is, is it valuable? Is any year valuable? Or is it only valuable if I achieve a sufficient amount to really get like, like the lottery ticket of, being, of becoming, like having a chance to become a doctor? So before, what does this bring, this idea that the, uh, the, the, the benefits of education may or may not be uh, obtained uh, from the first years of education, they might be, uh, we might be able to obtain them only if we get enough education. What does that remind you of that we've seen? Is that idea of the S-shape. So the question, and here again at this level, that's as usual, it's a question is, is there S-shape in education? So are the first few years of education valuable because, you know, you learn how to socialize, it's what they say in the movie, you learn how to socialize, you learn family planning, you learn maybe to read the instruction uh, in the packet of fertilizer for when you come back to the farm. So there might be reasons to think that even the first years of education would be valuable. Or is it the case that the first year of education are not really valuable, that the only thing that's worth it is a college education, and the first year of education, all that gives you is the option value of going to uh, uh, high school and then college if you want to. In which case, the, the latter case is a case where there is an S-shape. So unless you want enough, unless you get enough education, it's not worth it. And the former case is a case where there is, there is no S-shape. And so one empirical question is whether it's actually S-shape or it's actually not an S-shape. Another empirical question, of course, is the value of of education, wh whatever the shape, the, the overall level of the benefits. And the third question is, what are people thinking? Because even if it's in fact linear, if people think that it's actually a shape, that's going to influence their behavior in, 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 in going to influence uh, the, ch the, the choice that they are making. So for example, here they have all these discussions about is it even worth, wor worth it to send the kids to school? or not, because, and they don't, they never question the fact that it would be great if she could become a doctor, but they might question the fact that there might be a value of anything beyond, below being a doctor. Um, is there anything else that comes out of this? Yeah. I think Ben might have talked, I, I heard him say something about cultural, <coughs> but just the idea of the, the head scars, the preventing of the, girls from going to school, and then the, the idea of courage being assimilated as opposed to integrated in a, <coughs> a way that may, helps them maintain the culture. So again, that's like something that would deter people from going to school. Right. So that is, uh, that's kind of a uh, convex combination of the two points, the Ben's point and, and the point about, oh, once you send them to boarding school, they are going to not, they are not under your thumb. You can't, you can't, uh, check what they are doing anymore, which is reinforced in, in Turkey that you, it's not allowed to wear a headscarf in school. So the, from the beginning, there is a conflict there. Uh, is, it, you know, is school a way of indoctrinating the kids away from what you would like? And are the guys of providing them with valuable skills in the labor market? 
And there's certainly some amount of that, to be honest, that's actually said by the... The only thing we missed uh, from the movie, like one, well, we might have missed a bit more, but the only b piece we missed that I remember and is worth pointing out is the, the woman with the, with the, um, the hair like that, uh, who speaks with this very posh English accent, she, uh, the correspondent from The Economist, she's, she has the last word. And uh, uh, she, she mentions one thing that might be worth uh, pointing out, which is uh, this, was a, this is compulsory education. Th this drive to compulsory education was very much of a top-down intervention, was done without any consultation of anybody, was just done. And the way the schools are run is run in this completely centralized way with a centralized curriculum with uh, the teachers appointed from the center, the kids driven to boarding school, etc. And she says that that's not going to work, that uh, people are not going to accept or are not going to really be in, uh, in the mood or not to be really <coughs> groovy about the whole education thing unless they get given some autonomy in running these schools. So that is an important point because that's the point that many people make, that any effort at top-down education will, uh, hurt, will uh, meet some resistance from the people. They might still go because they have to go, but they won't, the parents won't be very engaged, the children won't be very engaged, the teachers might not be very, very engaged, and nothing will happen. Uh, so we keep that in mind. I just sort of, I'm, I'm channeling her because I want to keep that in mind as we have the discussion. Because this tension between oh, uh, education uh, bring brought from the top down uh, uh, and education emerging from the bottom up is one of the central debates in, in, in education. So I think you guys said a lot of the things that I wanted to, that I wanted to touch on. Let me kind of make sure that we have everything uh, everything together. So the stories of uh, Kurdish girl uh, who goes to boarding school after education was made compulsory until grade eight. Uh, so these many important team appear in the movie. I think we mentioned them. One are all the questions about the supply of education. So that seems to that seem to have been a constraint before this big education drive, education push from the Turkish government, and still is a constraint. Uh, there is no schools in the remote villages. The roads are bad. Uh, transportation is difficult. There, are, there is a shortage of well-trained teachers. Uh, therefore, there is the large class size, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the teachers are moving. What you were saying about the teachers coming from far away, not being necessarily the best teacher, most motivated teacher. So in, for a part of the international community, this type of constraint are the only thing you have to worry about. I think you guys probably have all seen a picture of a little African girl in a village saying that if only she had a school, she would study until she, is a t she would become a doctor. So there is a whole branch of the international community, governments, etc., who are kind of, for whom the only problem with education are supply problem. And if only we could get rid of the supply problem, make sure there are enough well-trained teachers, then the kids would go to school, they would learn something in school, and they would all be very educated. So the problem is a problem of fixing the supply constraint. But what we see in the movie is that these are not the only constraint. So the reason why it's relevant is that a lot of the international community, uh, a lot of the, in, uh, the policy, both in aid and the policies uh, implemented by the government, are that have that flavor in mind, which is let's fix the supply problems. So, for example, a lot of African countries have gotten rid of uh, school fees uh, completely to make, to make sure school was free. You go to a country like Kenya and there is a, a school every 25 meters because every community who wants a school can get one. So there is, a, there is pl plenty of schools. Uh, in some sense, one could say too many schools <laughs> in that the class size are actually quite small at the, at the top. Uh, and uh, um, uh, in India, it's the same thing. India is debating a right to education, where if you don't have a, a school right, right near your village, you can get one. 
But what we see in the movie is that it's not the supply of supply constraint, not having a school near you, etc., are not the only problem. Uh, there is a question of, in fact, Turkey is not only building schools and, and building these boarding schools and having kids uh, travel in the minibus to go to the school. They also made education compulsory. And if the only problem was supply, then making education compulsory would not be necessary. You would put the schools there and people would be delighted to go and you wouldn't need any uh, compulsion. In fact, Turkey decided that the only way that they could get a fast increase in education was to make education <coughs> compulsory. So implicitly, there is the argument that, well, maybe people would not want to go to all these schools. So there, mu there must be a demand constraint as well. There must be a, a lower demand for education. So what constrained them? We mentioned that. One is no economic resources, so they don't have money. So this, in principle, the direct cost of education can be uh, compensated by making education free, by paying for the books, by paying for transportation. Uh, but there is also the need for child labor that was mentioned in the movie. The kids who are in school are not helping around the farm. Uh, then there is the need to get married, which was mentioned by, by the Yapuak sister. She said, now I need to get married. And you can't be married and in boarding school. Well, in principle, you could, but it's, an, it's, it's not very frequent that you would be both married and in boarding school. So this is not a cost effect, right? This is something which is more about culture or maybe uh, the opportunity, maybe the, 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 the husband wants a young wife or there is something different than just a strict opportunity cost effect. Like why do they think that it's important to get married early instead of continuing your schooling? So these are like on the opportunity cost dimension. Then there are the benefits. Is it useful? Uh, is it useful only if you get uh, uh, enough education? If it's useful, do parents know that it is useful? What do they expect of education? Do they expect that education is making their child generally better at leading their life? Or do they expect education, do they see education as uh, the woman employs a term that is interesting, it's almost like a foreign currency. So people see your education diploma, do you see that as something that if, it's, if you get enough of it, you can actually sell to the market? If you, and uh, what, what is enough? Is it a foreign currency that you would get a few, a few cents off and that would be good enough? Or is it a foreign currency that you need a big packet of to be worthwhile? And in the movie, that what was interesting is that we saw different people having different views about whether it is a foreign currency, that is you have to take it elsewhere to benefit from it, whether you could also benefit from it just in your general life with uh, having fewer, healthier children, being more socialized. One of the, what does one of the, I think it's uh, again Yaprak's sister who says, who sees another advantage of education for girls in that it is going to increase her bargaining power within the family. She says traditionally girls are coy and not say, don't say anything and men have all the power and if girls get education that is going to improve their bargaining power <laughs> within the family. And that is something that girls might find very attractive and their future husband might find less attractive. And here the question is what are the fathers going to think? Is a father like uh, the Yaprak's father, on the one hand, he, he probably he has in mind uh, the value of uh, keeping the girls in their place. On the other hand, he likes his daughter. So there is probably a conflict within him between uh, the fact that as a man, he would rather, he doesn't want to conflict with his wife, so he would rather the woman being lower down. But as a father probably likes his daughter more than his son-in-law, who is not yet, doesn't even exist yet. So there might be a conflict here between, in his preferences, uh, between which might either lead him to say, fine, she should get an education, or no, we want to move forward. And what's inter what is interesting in the movie in his is that he clearly sees himself as a bit of a thought leader and a modern character. So he seemed to have uh, um, concluded this debate from his point of view to say that, okay, I'll send her. Right. 
Right, so there might be a little bit of that. So the, I'll just repeat the, repeat the question. The question was, that are, are they just indulging them for a little while and then going to bring them back in line? Uh, uh, and then education is more like, uh, it's not a, seen an, as an investment anymore, but more some consumption value for the girl, since the government is providing it for free and she's kind of a bit young to be really helpful in the farm. Let's, let's get her get an education, but we kind of know that at the end of the day, it's not going to change her life. And we certainly maybe hope that it's not going to change her attitude. What is interesting if, that, if this is what people had in mind is that that's clearly not her view. So there might be a little bit of a, of a disconnect here, which would be in her advantage in terms of when she gets the education. So uh, here, if we're thinking of this bargaining power issue and this potential conflict within the father between his role as a husband where he wants to keep the power and his role as a father where he, he would like probably her to have some power uh, is that that may change with uh, economic growth in the society and how, uh, what are the opportunities that he sees for her to do something with the education. If the society is completely paralyzed, then in a way, the benefits of education are not very high for her, so she, she has, he has less of a reason to, to want to go through it. Yeah. So just from watching the video, it seems like it is possible for them to combine both the cultural values and the value of education. Like, for instance, um, clearly it is a male-dominated society, but here we watch um, the scenes where there's a bunch of men sitting around and they're talking about the value of education. It's still the women who are serving the tea or whatever it was, and uh, you still see the women yeah, so it is possible that even with the education, they are still going to maintain the, the, the differences. What is interesting is that there is a level question and a, and a slope question, which is it is possible that the girls have so far to go that uh, uh, getting an education wouldn't be sufficient to, get, to make them become equal, but that would still go in that direction. And at least uh, some of them seem to have the hope that it would bring in that direction. But you're right that, uh, so, those, so those are the sort of the expected benefits of education. And then there is what worries them about the schools. We've mentioned the cultural assimilation, the fact that it might be like a covert way to, to assimilate them to a culture that's not theirs. Uh, and uh, the fact that maybe there, there are no benefits, the fact that just the f sending the kids away is not a very good thing. Potentially, they are worried about, about them. So these are the demand issues. So the demand issues are a little bit tricky because depending on the, how this thing balance out, what are the benefits they see versus the fears they have versus the immediate cost of not having the kids on the farm, or the decision of sending the kids or not sending the kids is not obvious even if education is free. And uh, making education compulsory, of course, pushes them in that direction. So the education that the benefits of education that are touched upon in the movie are uh, of different kinds. There is the, this foreign currency idea. You get a job, you get a higher wage. They hope that the girl is going to be a doctor. So the issue is, can everybody become a doctor? And probably not. So even though they don't say it in the movie, they must have in the corner of their mind that they are not quite sure that she's going to make it. They sort of say it, but it's, they're not quite sure it's going to make it. And that uncertainty and the fact that the objective is so hard certainly has some impact in how seriously they take the whole thing. And then there is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the possibility that, that just getting an education would help uh, in your job, doing your job better, even if your job is to be a farmer, coming back to the farm. And nobody seemed to really say that. It's only mentioned in a negative way, which is if only they taught something useful like uh, home economics, then maybe we would be able to, uh, to have some benefits of this education, but that's not what they are doing. And so maybe education is useless or is seen as being useless at the lower level. Then there are the non-monetary uh, dimensions of getting an education. Uh, girls will become more socialized. The family planning, they'll have more friends, they'll know how to interact with people in the city, uh, et cetera. And then there is the idea of learning things that you can teach others. So the one guy who has a college education in this men discussion, he goes and says, well, let them get an education, come back and teach us some stuff. 
And so this is the, uh, an external uh, spillover value of education, which is the opposite than the one that Ben had mentioned, which was the education envy. But it's the idea that if I get an education, if there is some benefits, for example, I learned how to read the instruction on the fertilizer package, maybe I learned to use new technology in agriculture. Not only it can be useful for me, but potentially can be useful for others. So if that is the case, a village might decide to focus on like, the smartest kids in the block and get them, make sure that they actually act, at least get an education so that everybody benefits. So those are kind of the, the benefits of education. So one empirical question is what are the real benefits of education? The other empirical question is what are people perceived to be the benefits of education? Another theme that is touched upon the, in the movie is this top-down versus bottom-up. So here the government is, is, uh, is trying a big top-down ap approach, trying to do it very fast, putting all the money from the top, making it compulsory, which is the ultimate top-down. Uh, and this type of supply-driven policy has been, as I was saying, popular in many countries. Many African countries, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Ghana, have recently, relatively recently, in the last uh, 10 years or so, adopted free primary education, are moving to free secondary education now. India, as I was saying, has a right to education, which actually allow people in principle to sue the government if they don't get to school. Uh, so, uh, so this supply drives has been uh, the main education policy uh, until uh, in the last, say, in the last three decades. Uh, the Millennium Development Goal specified that uh, uh, every child should get at least a basic education. Basic goes till nine years of education. Uh, what is interesting is that there is no mention anywhere that, is, that they should actually learn anything in those schools. It's sort of assumed that if they get nine years of education, they'll get something out of it. But as we will see, it's a pretty big assumption. And there are certainly some clear signs of success of these big supply drives. Uh, between 99 and 2006, the enrollment rate of, uh, have increased. In Sub-Saharan Africa, from 54% uh, to 70%. In, uh, uh, South, in East and Southeast Asia, from 75% to 88%. These are uh, primary school enrollment rate. Secondary school enrollments have also increased, even though secondary school is much more expensive, much more difficult to do for governments. So worldwide, there are still uh, a bunch of millions of kids who are not in school, but much less in 2006 than they were in 1999. So is it all worthwhile? That's the question that uh, Isterly is asking in the, in the reading for today. And what is his answer? His answer is not that graph, yeah. <coughs> Right, he is saying it's useless, and he's and the evidence. So why, why, how does he explain that despite the fact that it's useless, people have still done it? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Exactly. So what Isterly is saying is that you guys have been have been uh, fooled by this graph. So what is this graph? Uh, we have, uh, these are countries, USA, uh, Romania, Paraguay, Venezuela. And these are the average years of schooling of the population. And this is the log output per worker relative to the US. So everybody is negative because the US is the richer country in the world. And what you can see here is that there is a pretty strong correlation between the, uh, the log output per worker and the years of schooling. Countries which have more years of schooling are also richer. So one could conclude from there that a uh, year of education increases income. And people have certainly drawn this conclusion. What could we? What is his point about this graph? Yeah. I'm not sure this is the point, but it's 
the idea of like ability bias? Like, where do you have more education? Perhaps like that's because you have some sort of ability. I mean, I don't know if this is this is countries in the national. Sense. So think of think of like exactly make this argument not for a person but for a country. What's different about these countries as well? They also have more. I mean, they have the the GDPs are, are higher, so they have sort of more opportunity for support. Yes, they are more yes. more of everything. For example, so we could run this graph with uh, the number of uh, football team you have. Uh, you would probably have you. I mean, you would have a lot of zeros, so it wouldn't be such a good graph. But uh, you would have the same relationship that uh, places that play American football are also richer. And we don't think it's because of American football. I mean, at least I don't think so. But you may have a different view. Uh, so that correlation is not very informative. So what he's suggesting is to say, well, let's not look. So let's not look in levels. Let's look in go in differences. And I couldn't find such a nice looking graph for differences, but here is one. Now we have the difference in human capital from uh, say 19, it's 1990 minus 1965. So it's a log, it's, it's, a, it's a difference in the log of the of, uh, average years of education, okay? And now we put the log difference in income. We could do it in level, log, etc. doesn't matter. What's relevant in this graph is you get a big cloud of point and a completely horizontal line. So if I translate this graph in words, what this is saying is that the countries which have increased the most the average years of education of the labor force are the countries which have brought more and more, more, and more kids to, uh, to school have not become richer. So you compare, in the easterly reading, you had uh, two, he, he had a comparison between different African countries which had made different level of progress. Uh, so I think, say for example, Ghana versus Madagascar. And saying that Ghana has increased education more, Madagascar has increased education more, and Ghana has not grown faster than Madagascar. Actually, I don't think that's true anymore. I think subsequent to that, Ghana has increased quite, uh, grown quite a bit faster ma but than Madagascar. But that's, let's say, was the point, what the, the case at the time. So, what this is, so now we interpret in saying, well, when we take the difference out, now we, we're really seeing what has been the effort in terms of increasing the years of education versus the gain in terms of increasing the GDP, and we see no effect. So the level relationship was all coming from this bias, and in fact, the, there's no effect of the years of education. And the bias in the level regression are some form of the ability bias, uh, as, as you were saying, uh, Rich countries have more education because uh, they, it, it, it takes money to have, to have teachers. Uh, they can afford it. Or maybe they choose to be educated because when it's more worthwhile to get an education if you, have, if you can do something with that education. So that comes back to this argument of what's the point of getting an education if you're going to come back to the village anyway. So if education allows you to take advantage of uh, uh, the opportunities that are afforded by economic growth, then you're going to be more willing to get an education if you think that the country is going to grow a lot. So for all these reasons, you would expect more education in rich countries, not because education causes growth, but because growth is causes education. So his conclusion is that internationally driven investment to education were a waste, that education is actually useless. Now, there is a bunch of problems with his argument because, in a sense, what he is saying is that I don't see an evidence cross-country that there is a lot of uh, uh, increase in GDP coming from increasing education. But the issue is we don't know why these countries increased education. We don't know what would have happened if they had not increased education. So, for example, it is uh, many of the African countries that increased education the most also had civil war subsequently. Uh, it is possible that education caused the civil war, but it's not very likely. It is more likely that uh, the social tension that pre-existed in the country caused the civil war. And those social tension may also, one possible answer to the social so uh, t uh, tension may have been, well, let's try and get people an education. Yeah. Uh, this is interesting because I guess in our standard macro, macro class, you look at a factor of A, 
as a multiplicative factor to increase GDP. Um, and typically, maybe I'm thinking about it wrong, you would look at that as if you have increased education, it could be brought up more innovation. Um, if you have the technology, you just still go from the farm to your operating computer. And education helps facilitate that growth. Um, so I'm, I'm a little confused as to how you can make this conjecture. Uh, so that's an interesting fact. I think in a sense, you in this in your macro class, you may have been interpreting this, interpreting this graph. Right. You may have been interpreting the, and there are certainly a lot of theories for why education would be good for growth. So one of them is the one you point out, which is education allows the uh, uh, people, some people, this is the externality argument that we were making about the movie. One person who is educated can figure out some uh, technology, and then everybody can use the technology, so they are all these spillovers, which is why we would get this pretty strong relationship between education and income. So there are a lot of theoretical reasons to think that there could be a macroeconomic relationship between ed education and income. And in fact, we see one, which is why everybody sort of is happy thinking education is a good thing. What Easterly is saying is just commenting this graph, which is he doesn't see a relationship because when he does a relationship in differences now between growth in education and growth in, and growth in income, he doesn't see the relationship anymore. How long is that? That's 1990, 1965. It was about 30 years. Yep. I have a question. Uh, in Easterly's paper, he mentions uh, the productivity factor. Um, and he says that only a small percentage of this is accounted for by human capital and by machinery and other forms of capital. What is the rest of it? Like, what is productivity in that case? Uh, so that's an excellent question, uh, which is the answer to this question is that's why I do, uh, that's why I do what I do and not macroeconomics. Uh, <laughs> if you're looking at growth uh, across the country and you're trying to account for the growth, in, uh, in, an, in a pure accounting sense, which is to say, uh, so imagine that each country is a, is a big machine. Think of a country as a machine. So there, are, there is a machine, there is some people to operate the machine, labor, and there is some human capital to think about how to operate the machine, and then there is some spunk. So that, think of a, a macroeconomy as that. Uh, in, in, in letters, we write it as an A multiplied by K, that's the capital, to some power, multiplied by L to some power, multiplied by human capital to some power. That's your macroeconomic model of an economy. Now, when we look at, so now we can look at, we can observe K to some extent, what's the capital in the economy. We can observe L to some extent, how many, to a pretty good extent, how many workers there are in the economy. We can observe H to some extent, how, what is the human capital, usually measured with education. And then we can say, well, let's look at now what part, and the rest spunk is what we don't observe. Now we can say, well, let's look at what share of the level of, of, of income of the country, differences in income across country, or what share of differences in growth across country are explained that by those factors. And the answer is not very much. So the answer is that with factors such as capital, labor, and human capital, measured in this way, we don't explain much of the growth differences across country. This is one of the reasons why, which is when you look at growth and you look at differences in human capital, there's just no relationship. So a bit more with, with physical capital, and the rest is like, we don't know. So technological progress is just a fancy term for we have no clue what the hell is going on. Uh, so which is saying, which is to me saying that, well, if we have no clue what the hell is going on, then it means that we need to go beyond like thinking of the economy as one big machine. And we need to start to understand what is happening at the local micro level that might start giving us a sense of what, what might actually be going on. Because technological progress is not just like how good is the chip in your computer? Is they, you think of this as like, as I was saying, the spunk, how people interact all of that. Um, so that's the, um, uh, so in the, in your, macro growth, in your macro class, you either saw this graph and commented on it, or you may have also seen a graph where you have growth on the left hand side and level of education. 
you do see a strong relationship between growth and level. These countries which had more education in 1965 have grown faster between 65 and, 95 and 1990. But what Easterly objects to that is that, yes, of course, because if you anticipate growth, that's how you're going to decide to get an education, because education becomes more, more worthwhile. So that's, that does not tell me that education is worth anything. So that's where we are with the macro data. And the, my bottom line is not that your macro class is wrong or that uh, your macro class is right. My bottom line is we just don't know by just looking at this data. You don't have enough data points and anything could have happened. And the countries which were about to have wars may have invested more in education, perhaps as a, an attempt to not have those wars, or who knows. So in order to answer the question of what's the benefits of education, we need to look at, uh, we need to look at, at this, at specific example. So ideally, I would have liked to look at for you at the example of Turkey, because we just saw it in the movie, but I, I don't have it. Uh, so we'll be looking at the example of Indonesia. So if we're looking at uh, the effect of uh, supply-driven expansion, there are some arguments when one could see that it's not going to work. And these are the arguments that Easterly is making. And we kind of all saw them in the movie. There, is, there was the point about the teacher quality, you know, if the teachers don't care because they've just been parachuted by the central government to the community, exactly as you were saying, then, you know, the, the, uh, the level of education is not going to be very good. If the parents don't care and just do it because they have to do it, then they are not going to put pressure on the teachers to actually deliver. And they are not going to put pressure on the children to actually, uh, to actually learn. So the extreme cases is what the point that you were making earlier, where the children are all alone in boarding school and nobody is looking after what they do and potentially they learn nothing and, or, or they might learn to do all sorts of bad stuff. Uh, so if uh, parents do not think that schools has, are, are delivering anything useful, then they won't pay attention. And finally, children, if they also don't care, won't pay attention. So these are all theoretical arguments. I'm not saying they are correct, but these are the type of argument that Easterly is making. So how would we know whether or not there is a benefit of education? So as I was saying, I don't really want to interpret the cross-country evidence. I think it's very difficult to interpret. So I want to focus on one country. And there's one country that did almost the same thing that, uh, in, that Turkey did. And they, fortunately for us, they did it not a few years ago, but many years ago. So now we can look at those kids as they are in the labor market, and we can see whether it was beneficial for them to be uh, sent to these schools. So that country is Indonesia. Indonesia is, is an oil producing country. So when there was a big oil shock, in 1970, uh, starting in 1973, for Indonesia, it was actually good news because they were producing oil, so they became richer. And uh, they decided that they were going to use this oil money to build a lot of schools. Basically, all the oil money the first few years went into building tons of schools. Tons means they built almost 62,000 schools all over the country, but particularly in places which had uh, low education enrollment. So if you ultimate top down. P furthermore, what is interesting in relationship with Turkey is that they had exactly the same objective, which is they, would, they wanted the kids to learn Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, that's the, the, the language for the country. Even people in the outlying island and stuff like that. And they wanted everyone to learn the state ideology, which was the Pancasila. It's kind of halfway between an ideology and a religion that, uh, they had, that Suharto was keen on. So it was entirely pushed by public effort. So you say exactly your cases of, like, if it was going to fail, then this was going to fail. And what do we see? So these graphs are the number of schools that were built in a region. And this is the difference between the education of the young cohort who benefited from the school and the education of the old guys who didn't benefit. So you see that in general, it's always positive because education went up over time between the young and the old. That makes sense. But it is also increasing in slope. That is, places which got more schools got more years of education. Maybe that's not surprising because that's almost a mechanical result of putting schools. But this graph is, is an interesting one. I'm now looking at the wages of people in 1995. 
difference between the, the wages of the young minus the wages of the old. And I'm look, so this is a, uh, now is they are all negative because old people have more experience so they tend to make more money. But what is interesting here is not the negative thing, it's the slope again. The slope is again positive. So it is saying that compared to the old guys, the young people benefit more in places which built more schools. And it's very difficult to think of a story why it would be the case, except that they benefited from the education. So it seems to be the case that uh, building more, parachuting more schools to communities increase years of education, increase uh, wages, and that seems to imply that education increases wages. And in fact, if you, could put, if you put two and two together, you find that the effect of education on wages is about 8%. You can use similar experiments to look at the non-monetary effect of education. So Taiwan, around the same time, a little bit before, uh, also did a top-down drive to increase education. What they did is uh, um, an education, uh, compulsory education. And what you find in 1968, and what you find is compulsory education in Taiwan led to an increase of education. That's not surprising, but also a reduction in infant mortality in places where education increased more as a result. So again, these are the non-monetary non benefits. Nigeria did the same thing as Indonesia for the same type of reasons. They used their oil money to build schools. Again, they build more schools in some regions than some others. And again, you can compare the changes in, place in, in infant mortality and in fertility and in wages in places where they built more schools and in places where they built fewer schools. And the more schools they built, the, more, the higher the education, the higher the wages, the lower the fertility, the lower the infant mortality. So the bottom line, when we do look at specific, uh, specific uh, uh, top-down policies, is that they actually are useful, that it seems to be that there is a return to education, corresponding to about 8% increase in wages for every extra year that you spend in school. So, when we look at, at the thing in detail we, and we answer this question, we think, yes, there is a benefit of education. What we are going to do next is to say, well, is the benefit as high as it could be? And that's where we are going to see the limits of this kind of, uh, of things having to do with the quality of education, the motivation of the teachers, the motivation of the parents, etc., which we'll do next time.